Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture e-book. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Kedda for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will start with the subchapter on desertification and drought in chapter 22, Hydrometeorological Disasters in the Day and Age of Climate Change. Understanding El Nino induced natural calamities. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading sessions before we start tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agro meteorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agro meteorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal healthcare access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with the subchapter on desertification. Climate change is not a watershed event like the Asian tsunami for instance unless we have a huge super volcano which has a global impact and can lead to an ice age overnight like it did after Lake Toba. The Anthropocene version of climate change is triggered by anthropogenic factors like industrial pollution and unsustainable development far in excess of other natural geological causes and cycles. Climate change manifests as an increase in the intensity of extreme weather events. So you have more frequent avalanches, blizzards in colder areas, more precipitation, more intense cyclones, cloud bursts, coastal incursion, desertification, droughts, Epidemics, flash floods, El Nino floods, famine, fog, fugue, forest fires, global warming, hailstorms, mudslides, landslides, storms, sea level rise, iceberg melt triggered tsunamis, urban floods and so on. And of course the volcano. Uh, each of these extreme weather events can have colossal impact on human communities and society. The consequences include food and livelihood insecurity, lack of shelter, causing more imbalanced fiscal growth. Skewed fiscals include impaired tax regimes, uh, impact on public health like COVID-19 has shown us, impact on international trade and commerce, tax, aviation, shipping, public health, human development and so on. Today let, us, let me read out to you desertification and how to combat desertification. Malla Reddy of the Rural Development Trust in Anantapur district of Andhra Pradesh told me in an interview back in November 2002 and I quote, six out of ten years are drought affected in Anantapur, unquote. Such chronic drought made Anantapur the second most desertified district in India in 1994. The groundwater table plummeted to 60 meters underground. Chronic crop loss led to mal malnourishment and severe poverty among the farming community led to school dropout rates increasing. Famine loomed large, rainfall almost ceased and desertification set in. Sand dunes started appearing over a stretch of some 80 square kilometers in the hinterland of Anantapur district. It was an unparalleled and unprecedented crisis. A desperate rural population sunk bore wells indiscriminately, depleting the groundwater table further. There was no more green cover to act as catchment for rainwater or to replenish groundwater table. With withering green cover, the district which is used to scanty rainfall had to confront complete failure of monsoons. Withering greenery meant livestock too were deprived of fodder. Cattle died. The government of Andhra Pradesh anointed 10 NGOs for holistic watershed management to mitigate desertification. The government also lent political will and financial support to the district administration. Salinity set in the groundwater table. Soil was rendered alkaline and it withered crops. Hot winds and repeated droughts created intense moisture stress, according to Mr. late Mr. Rajan Joshua of the Soci Social, Educational and Development Society or SEDS in Penukonda Taluk of Anantapur district in Andhra Pradesh. 
SETS was one of the NGOs funded for intensive and holistic watershed management. Parvatama said before watershed management program, there was great difficulty in bringing water as we had to go to the open wells at the bottom of the hills and to climb steps up and down. But after watershed management, this difficulty is reduced because wells and bow wells are recharged. Parvatama told, the, told me in an interview for a radio documentary that I did for Deutsche Welle World Service, World Service Radio back in 2003. Watershed management entailed conserving every single drop of rainwater at the point of occurrence. The first steps were soil conservation and catchment area conservation. Water bodies collected all the rainfall in simple troughs. These troughs or command areas are designed on the ground through contour bunding, check dams and gully check construction. These check dams impound rainwater from running off. Apart from soil conservation, employment opportunities were created, better healthcare facilities offered, literacy campaigns were also taken up as auxiliary means. Sustainable watershed management helped in raising the water table to 5 meters below the ground. Today, there is plenty of clean water and greenery. Wildlife like jackals and hyenas, bears and leopards, snakes, monitor lizards have returned to their recovering habitat. I am going to read out next the excerpts from my Deutsche Welle radio documentary script on successful watershed management and combating desertification in Anantapur district of South, in Southwest Andhra Pradesh, India. This is a box item in my book. Excerpts from my DWR radio documentary. Apart from soil, soil conservation, conservation, employment opportunities were created, better healthcare facilities offered, literacy campaigns were also taken up as an auxiliary means. Sustainable watershed management helped in raising the water table to 5 meters, meters below the ground. Today, there is plenty of clean water and greenery. Ramakka is an illiterate tribal woman and works as a gardener in the Adada Kulapalli watershed plantation in Anantapur district in South, South India. She earns about 12 euros a month. She also has an immense satisfaction of nurturing green canopy where none existed. My, I'll quote her now. My name is Ramakka. My husband who was working here in this watershed as a watcher died. After he died, I went to the office and requested them to give me that job to look after the plants. They agreed. I am now earning about 600 rupees per month, which was in 2002. Uh, in that money, I am also able to save some money, she says. In the village, I am now getting good respect. I am happy and contented with this work. Women like Ramaka also earn a living by selling clay pots to the NGO. These 15 litre clay pots are used for pot drip irrigation. Pot drip irrigation entails placing pots in the tree bed and every few hours women like Ramakka water these pots to the brim. A small hole at the bottom of the pot trickles the water to the tree roots for about 5 hours at least continuously. The raising of fruit bearing plantations in this arid zone has its long term advantages. Nothing other than weeds grew here. Fruit bearing trees like mangoes, berries, tamarind, the Indian beech tree, neem and jackfruit provided the much needed perennial supply of fodder, food, firewood to the impoverished people. Besides, these species withstood arid zone conditions, low water supply and soil erosion commendably. Evergreen trees that these are, they helped in retention of moisture in this arid zone. They contributed significantly to recharging the groundwater table. Late Rajan Joshua, the director of Social Education and Development Society or SEDS explained further to me and I quote, our trust in watershed management focuses on construction of check dams, water harvesting ponds, percolation tanks and minor irrigation dams over an area of 3000 hectares. In my experience, Albezia lebec, Samania, Samania saman or the rain tree, Pongemia pinnata or the Indian beech tree, Cassia siamia, a flowering tree with good manure yielding capacity, Glyricidia, also a fodder yielding tree, Delonyx regia and Delonyx elata are shade giving trees with large canopies and fuel wood supply. Peltoforum mangifera indica are good fruit bearing trees. Acacia trees, etc., are good survivors in such arid zones, he said. 
The point George Brock was emphasizing was the significance of endemic and native trees. Acacia trees were good to withstand harsh arid conditions till soil nutrition was restored and stabilized. Ecological succession of botanical diversity helps in restoring soil nutrition in water-stressed areas. From watershed management, a family of six members with two cattle heads has been acquiring up to six tons of fodder and two tons of fuel wood every year, said Bhimappa, a rural development activist at Rural Development Trust in Anantapur. In an article by me on the same subject for the Deccan Herald and reproduced on the ER net of the IISC Bangalore is a link that I will be putting up here as well as in the description box below. I have said here and I quote, according to Dr. T.V. Ramachandra of the Center for Ecological Sciences in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, quote, holistic approach helps in enhancement in the productivity of all components of watershed management, be they grazing lands, crop plants, water systems or anything else. In the comments, Dr. T.V. Ramachandra says, based on soil and climatic conditions, mixture of species, preferably species which cater to fuel, food and water needs to the, of the population are called for. Further, shrubs and trees also contribute to replenishment of groundwater and soil nutrition and serve the interests of cattle and livestock farming. Preferred grasses and shrubs include Lucania latticil. Latticilqua, Sesbania grandiflora, Sesbania sesban, Gliricidia maculata, Dismanthus vigratus, Penicetum clandestinum, Panicum antidotale, among others. I have no idea if I've pronounced the botanical names correctly. That's a disclaimer. Collection and sustenance of fodder banks, husbanding the plantations create employment opportunities. In fact, a novel means of drip irrigation adopted by SEDS utilizes the clay pots and stashes, stashes them strategically in the plant bed just under the tree sapling or just beside the tree sapling. A small pin hole is made at the bottom of the clay pot and a piece of bone cloth is tied to the mouth of the pot and dragged all the way to the pin hole. Women gardeners water these pots twice or thrice a day. The water drips, through, drips out through the pinhole after soaking through the cloth. Uh, the cloth slows the process of dip, drip irrigation. Horticulture plantations boasting varieties such as mango, jackfruit, tamarind, etc. Besides custard apple and Cyzetium cumini or the java fruit. Apart from Pongamia pinnata and other fodder yielding species are being husbanded by these women gardeners and they seem to have proven how hardy a species they are in this drought prone area. The socio-economic benefits of watershed management in drought prone areas have a cascading effect on the community in more ways than one. Education plays a critical role in watershed management, says Dr. T.V. Ramachandra. Employment opportunities lead to socio-economic benefits like neutralizing the caste inequities, supply of fodder and fuel wood, and animal husbandry got a boost. Creation of cooperative banking and rotation corpus fund helped in microfinance. Decentralized administration and democratic functioning with transparency was an offshoot. Captive plantations to serve the needs of the entire society and employment generation and sustenance of a rural economy made it a holistic experiment that succeeded. Desertification is more or less a man-made disaster. Des Desertification is caused by callous watershed management and severe water stress. Like all hydrometeorological disasters, mitigation calls for proactive conservation measures for long-term resilience and drought mitigation. Catastrophic events share characteristic non-linear behaviors that are often generated by cross-scale interactions and feedbacks among system elements. These events result in surprises that cannot easily be predicted based on information obtained at a single scale. Progress on catastrophic events has focused on one of the following two areas. Non-linear dynamics through time without an explicit consideration of spatial connectivity or spatial connectivity and the spread of contagious processes without a considerable, without a consideration of cross-scale interactions and feedbacks. These approaches rarely have ventured beyond traditional disciplinary boundaries. An interdisciplinary conceptual and 
general mathematical firework for understanding and forecasting nonlinear dynamics through time and across space has been proposed. Decisions that minimize the likelihood of catastrophic events must be based on cross-scale interactions and such decisions will often be counterintuitive. Given the continuing challenges associated with global change, approaches that cross disciplinary boundaries to include interactions and feedback at multiple scales are needed to increase our ability to predict catastrophic events and develop strategies for minimizing their occurrence and impacts. Daily and colleagues at the World Bank broke down the most of the most of the globe into 8 million grid cells of about 25 square kilometers each. Then they map the risks of human and economic damage from six types of disasters such as cyclones and landslides onto each one and built up a picture of the world's most exposed places. In these places, more than 90% of people are at high risk of death for two or more types of disaster. The researchers define high risk areas as having the top 30% of risk compared with other areas of the world. Although many of these areas were already known to be in danger, the report provides a more sophisticated way to compare risks across countries and regions, allowing governments and aid agencies to prioritize their resources. Much of the damage and deaths that disasters cause is preventable by building earthquake-proof structures, for example. But repeated hits lock many of the world's developing countries into a cycle that makes it difficult to fund changes, especially as much aid goes into immediate relief efforts. The World Bank plans to use its hotspot map to identify those countries most in need and help them implement a preventive rather than reactive approach to disasters. Its approach is already affecting homeowners in Turkey who must weather frequent earthquakes. When providing aid, the World Bank requires them to buy insurance for their homes. This shifts the responsibility for safe buildings from the government to the individual and private sector insurance companies. The World Bank also intends to encourage governments to invest in measures such as flood embankments and cyclone shelters by granting loans to countries who, plans for, who plan for disasters. Countries have already started to request money specifically for risk management, indicating that the message is getting through. We must stop making it more complicated than it is. If you want to reduce problems after disasters, you just have to protect people by giving them better housing, better education and better health services. With that, we have finished desertification. However, please don't forget to watch a whole documentary I recently made on the subject of combating desertification in rain-shadowed Anantapur district. It can be found on a link which will be put up here in the description box below. Epidemics Epidemics can be a cause as well as a consequence of disasters. When natural calamities trigger disasters in the human landscape, Diseases break out as a consequence of broken sewage lines, water contamination, deficit in sanitation, appalling living conditions because of overcrowding in relief camps and so on. It emphasizes the need for a planned economy and planned human development index. Deaths associated with natural disasters, particularly rapid onset disasters, are overwhelmingly due to blunt trauma, crash-related uh, injuries or drowning. 